Well, hello, Barb. How are you today? Great. Good. <laughs> yes. Finally caught up on all my sleep that I lost. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, we, just, we just got back from Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, where we had a great weekend of teaching and hanging out at the PEI Fiber Festival. Mm -hmm. But the time change, the time difference is, uh, it's a little, you know, kind yeah. of messes Three. with your head a bit. Three hours or three and a half? Three, three. hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The three hours That's right. of us. Yeah. And then the plane ride home was a rather long one. Mm -hmm. It sure I think was. Like yeah. Yeah. Three, so, close to 3 a.m. <laughs> so that's that's the excuse on why our podcast is coming out a couple of days later than we would normally put it out. We knew you'd understand that uh, we just needed a bit more time to catch up on some sleep and some laundry and, you know, all that good stuff. But we have a pretty full agenda for you today. So let's get right into it. You want to let's do the intro? Part? Sure. So we are Barb and Cynthia with Yarniversity. I think we've, we're pretty much going by that name now. We've almost even dropped the by River City Yarns. <laughs> That's right. It's, <laughs> it's know, the fine Cynthia. print. <laughs> yeah, she's wearing her t-shirt. Yay, good for you. And um, yeah, and we are local yarn shop owners, uh, now teachers online, full time, no yarn, all classes. Right. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. That's great. And we call our monthly podcast, Podcast On, or Podcast On podcast on you know mm -hmm. uh and we've been doing this now for several years yeah. uh, and so if you're new if this is the first time you've logged in to join us then welcome we're really uh we're really glad that you came out to talk to us to to, to talk with us today uh mm -hmm. we promise not to just talk at you we will include you in the conversation and ask you some questions we'd love to have you respond in the comment section below or to the side, uh, depending on what kind of device you're using, because we, we we seriously love to hear from you, and we will try to respond to everything that you say in the comment section. It is a great place to catch up with us, because we do read those. Um, we have to make sure that we make this one public, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, Barb. So <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> you have to tell us last last month episode 93 i you know usually post it up to youtube as an unlisted video and that gives barb a chance to review it uh before we make it public but i and it also gives me the opportunity to put links into places like our newsletter or uh social media posts which i did and so some of you saw it but if you subscribed, you wouldn't have gotten a notification because I forgot to make it public until, I don't know, maybe a week ago. Uh, so I pushed it out then. So you may be getting two notifications in close order saying, you know, there's something to see from uh, Barb and Cynthia. But apologies, friends. Uh, that was not intended. Um, but good news is if you subscribe to our newsletter, We'll always put a link in there so you can see the latest uh, tutorials or uh, podcast on uh, episodes that we publish. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about where we've been, what we've been teaching, things like that. Um, if you'd like to see specific things from us, let us know. We'd be happy to tailor this. Cynthia and I were chatting, I think, on the plane on the way home about you know, trying to add a little bit more content about how to do things, you know, like there were so many cool tips and tricks that we were able to show folks at this class. And we thought, oh, that might be fun to share on YouTube as well. Yes. So we will put in uh, a little, uh, we'll, at the end of this podcast, we'll add on a tutorial video that uh, we've created for some of our classes. But I'll also put in the show notes down below a link to it. So if you'd like to watch it just on its own, you can do that too. But stay tuned because we'll tell you about that in a bit. Okay. Well, let's let's jump right in. All right. So you got some classes you want to tell us about. 
Yeah, yeah, we've got some we've got some great uh, events coming up, and I'm quite excited about them. The first one is uh, No Fun Like Gnome Fun with Sarah Shira. Uh, Sarah is an amazing person. Oh, good. And Barb's got her got Barb's got her book uh, up in the window. Sarah Shira just uh, published a new book uh, called The Gnomes of Grimblewood. And uh, she's going to come to your university to teach a class called No Fun Like Gnome Fun, G-N-O, Fun Like no, like Gnome Fun. And that'll be on Saturday, October the 12th. So this coming Saturday. In this class, she's going to teach you how to make toys in the form of gnomes. And she'll cover all the things like stuffing and um, knitting small things and how to get started with I-cord. And, uh, you know, it's, it's packed full. So if you've never knit a gnome before or if you're curious about how to make toys and get some great advice from a toy maker uh this is the class for you the so thing i'm so excited about with this new book is that sarah uses rowan felted tweed for a lot of these gnomes which just happens to be one of my favorite yarns i'm wearing felted tweed today in my easy folded poncho that's perfect barb Mm. Uh, and let's let's tell everybody uh, about the easy folded poncho. Let's just take a little tiny sidetrack about that because that's a really popular pattern. I've got one on my mannequin here too. So mm. tell us about that pattern. Yeah, well, this was one of the patterns that we would use when we brought in like a new line of yarn that we were really excited about making sweaters with or something like that. So I generally knit up an easy folded poncho in it. And um, felted tweed is just, one of those yarns that is now available in so many colors and it goes with pretty much everything. It's a, a Tweedy uh, wool yarn that has a little bit of alpaca in it and uh, it goes with so much in your wardrobe. It makes a great yarn for sweaters or for gnomes. Perfect. Yeah. And the easy folded poncho is a pattern by Churchmouse Yarns and Tea. Uh, you can purchase the pattern as a PDF or directly from them, or you can find it on Ravelry as well. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and I'll put a link. We'll put a link into the pattern in the show notes below. And we'll also put in a link for Rowan Felted Tweed because it's a beautiful yarn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, did you know Sarah's going to be at Rowan Connect? I did know that. Yes. Yes, she's going to be talking about her book and about making gnomes and why it's such a perfect project. Yeah. She's also doing a knit along uh, from November 10th to 30th. And I know that's next month, but we wanted to tell you about that in case you wanted to join her class, No Fun for Gnome Fun, and learn all the things about making gnomes and then order the book. And then you could join the knit along that Sarah's organizing in yeah. November. Yeah, we have to put fun. that on our calendar too, because I have to do one of these new gnomes. Don't you? Yes. Yes, I do. I, I'm very excited about the new gnomes because, mm -hmm. well, we'll let Sarah tell you about that. Before I let you go, um, give us the, oh, I don't know, two minute plug on your brand new book. Well, I've wanted to be an author since I was eight, and I have been rejected many, many times. And it's the gnomes that got me there in the end. So they truly are magical little creatures. <laughs> so I published a book um, coming out in uh, on Sunday, actually, the 15th. And it is called The Gnomes of Grimblewood. And in it are eight patterns for adorable little gnomes in all sizes and in terms of like if you're a real cable person there's a cable gnome and if you're a real I just like it simple they've gone and if you like I like them weird and and really mischievous we've got that and so the the book here um has also one of the special things is every one of them is knit in two weights of yarn because not everybody likes really little yarn so the book goes into all of those um Actually, if I fold this out, you can see oh, oh, a, a, many of them, but not all of them. And so um, the book's got a um, really fun set of directions. Okay, here's a little behind the scenes thing. It wasn't till we were filming that I realized that the, the gnome that I who I had thought of as being the swirly beard. Let me get you a picture here. The swirly beard gnome here, Nolan. It wasn't till we were photographing that I realized that it worked like a bracelet 
like a fashion fabulousness. And so I um, was so excited. Mid, um, my dad helped uh, with, the, with the photos, or I shouldn't say, my dad did most of the photos and I did most of the styling and we, we worked together. And my dad had to put up with a lot of absolutely insane giggling as I realized this was happening during our photo shoot. But so the other thing that's really fun, I think, about the book is Four of the eight gnomes have been written to have mix and match capacity. So this gnome, for instance, is one of those four. So if you like this hat, but you want it on a different body, they completely can be swapped in and out. And so um, that's something I wanted to do. And it's also one of the reasons why I didn't do um, each gnome in just one yarn weight. Because if I did two yarn weights, I could do two different colors. Oh. And I think sometimes people get locked in and what's in the book. I want to do exactly that. But like, okay, but which one? And say one of them's got feet and one of them doesn't. And, and there's beards in here that you can kind of swap in and out. And so I really wanted people to have the freedom to play because I think what makes gnomes so attractive to people is they're so, they're such playful knitting. There's, they're not like a to-do list. Oh, I should knit another sweater. I should do this. It's like, they're just small and playful. And I really wanted to emphasize the play capacity in the book. So yeah. Are there stories in the book too, Sarah? There are. Not if you've ever done one of my December gnomes, it's not like yeah. storybook level, but each little gnome has a biography and <laughs> um a little story to start it all off. So oh. this little one, for instance, is Gnarly. Um, Gnarly is an avid mountain biker. Brimblewood has a lot of gnarly paths that get the adrenaline flowing. He likes to recover with a plate of scones and nut butter before washing his bike. Tummy first, gears second is his post-ride motto. <laughs> oh, Sarah, that's lovely. Totally, totally lovely. I'm so excited. I'm an author. I, this is a funny thing. Um, when I realized that you could interlibrary loan my book, that was one of my big moments. I like I already knew the book was going to exist, but there was a certain point in the process where I was like, oh, people could interlibrary loan it. Like, what a silly, really niche thing to be excited about. But I am married to a librarian, so there there is some influence there. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. And so if you haven't already, uh, friends, uh, make sure that in addition to buying a copy of the book, you tell your library to request a copy of the book as well. Take Thank care, you so Sarah. much. Bye. See you. So cute. They're kind of like fat and different body shapes this time round. <laughs> this looks a little bit like our snowman pattern that Ann Bud developed for us. It's true, yeah. Yeah. Sure no, shot. Frosty. Fringy beard. Cute. And then uh, the next day, so that's Saturday, and then on Sunday, uh, we're going to a Fiberside chat with Corey Eichelberger. Uh, that's on Sunday, October 13th. And her topic is going to be favorite, sometimes surprising, knitting tips, and a two-color cast on. Hi, everybody. My name is Corey Eichelberger, and I go by IROC Knits everywhere on the internet. And IROC is just my first name spelled backwards, but there's a little story that goes along with that as well. I'll be sharing that when I do my chat through the Longmont Yarn Shop on October 13th, a Sunday afternoon. I'm so excited to be asked to share my best tips and tricks of all time. I'm a knitwear designer, teacher, and podcaster, and over 35 years of knitting, I have glommed on to a number of tips and tricks that I bet you've never heard about. I teach a class called Fixer Upper, where we fix things that have gone horribly wrong in knitting designs, knitting patterns, and just plain knitting. And so I'm hoping that I can share with you some things that might fix those mistakes that we've had ill-fitting objects just make our knitting a little bit better. So I will be sharing those favorite tips of all time, some a little as bit. As well as Corey's two color long tail cast on that's fun and easy and brings a lot of bang for your buck on a cast on edge that I developed when I wrote my first knitting pattern. You have two books that I have written, Minnesota 52, 16 Knits Inspired by the Road, as well as my heart book, Knit Words, 
Eight designs that celebrate the I wrote up eight patterns with knitting terms all over them. You may have seen the sweater that has all the knitting terms all the way down, and I just couldn't stop, so it became a tune in. So please come over and join me while we share some tips and tricks and a great cast on that you may have never tried before. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the fiber side chats, Barb, we sometimes get questions about them like, what are they and how mm. are we related to that? Do you, you wanna answer that yeah. question? Sure. Well, Fiberside Chats was originated from Longmont Yarn Shop in Colorado. And I think we uh, saw what they were doing early on in COVID. They were connecting um, instructors and their community together. And at that time, I think they had about five or six other stores uh, that were joining them. And they, they were collaborating to bring customers together to watch kind of some famous people. They had the power of knowing uh, Stephen West and a bunch of uh, really great instructors. And so we too had a real relationship with um, some Canadian instructors, some of our friends. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity for us to join in as well and bring our Canadian content and community together. And that's what we did. And since then, I think it's grown into not just a chat with famous celebrities and not so famous knitting instructors, but also a summer crawl. So a virtual yarn crawl that happens every summer. And it's been an awful lot of fun and um, something I think that people really resonates with people because you can join in over Zoom. You don't have to travel anywhere. You don't have to even be there. You can watch the recording. So it's a great opportunity to connect in and learn and be entertained and have a lot of fun and shop as well with yarn shops. Speaking of good finds, uh, we also have Kate Atherley coming back this month. So she's going to be doing a class called The Good, The Bad and The Pooling on October 17th. This is a one hour more discussion style class. It's maybe more of a lecture presentation than a workshop. But in this one, she's going to unlock the secrets of hand painted yarns. You know, you buy a skein of yarn and it's gorgeous and you love it because it's got that shot of red in it, or you know, maybe it's got some jewel tones that you find are really striking. And then you go to knit it up and you you find out that 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 precious color that you that drew your eye, it gets muddied up in the knitting. You know, you, you can't see it, you can't find it. It gets mixed in with all the other colors. And so Kate's going to give you some um, tips on how to recognize what that variegated or hand-dyed special precious skein of yarn is going to look like when you knit it up. So she's going to give you some strategies for predicting how that pooling or that, um, yeah, pooling, I guess is the best word for it, is going to um, show up in your work. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I find this class is, it's a really good way of managing those special hand-painted yarns that you have in your stash. For sure. Mm -hmm. So that one's uh, October 17th, uh, and that's going to be a ton of fun. Kate is always super knowledgeable uh, with, with all of her things, all of her discussions. And then we, uh, we've we taken a short break from the Makers Meetup because this Monday is our uh, Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving. And so there won't be a Makers Meetup this Monday, but we will be getting back together again on Monday, October 21st. And every following Monday thereafter. Uh, the Makers Meetup has been an important part of what we do. We, we connect with people from all over North America in a number of different time zones. And uh, it's a weekly, what would you call it, Barb? A weekly check-in with friends? Yeah, I kind of call it a show and tell. You know, we uh, get together just like you would if you were going to the yarn shop. You know, you'd pop in and uh, bring your project along and just chat with friends and uh, kind of update them on what everybody's been up to. It's kind of a go round the room uh, social 
connection. Well, let's do this again, Barb. Let's take a short deviation from the agenda and uh, maybe tell me a little bit about what you might be bringing to the Makers Meetup on Monday. What What are you working oh. on right now? Um, well, I'm working on my Ann Bud pleated skirt. Oh, yes. I've got it on the needles here. So this is this is wow. the top of it. This is ends up being a fold over hem and an elastic goes in here. But if I hold it up to the camera, can you see the pleats that are starting to develop? Yes, it looks beautiful. Yeah, it really it still needs, of course, to be blocked and but this is a lovely yarn from uh, Ancient Arts. It's called Oasis. It's one of my favorites. I'm not sure that Carolyn uh, has it active on her website anymore. But um, last time I talked to her, she just had a very little bit left. And so it might already be on the shelves. But this is a beautiful merino and uh, yak, 20% Either camel or yak. I can't, I can't remember now. <laughs> How does it feel? I have to look on Ravelry. <laughs> what What does it feel like? Does it feel like a yak or does it feel like a camel? Feels like a yak to me, but <laughs> could be wrong. Don't put me on that. Um, but it's a beautiful yarn, and I've swatched it. I know it's going to be really nice in a skirt, and so um, – I've got, I think, but one skein left. I've gone through two. Well, this is the nice thing about the skirt class, right? Is that you can use, uh, it takes a smaller amount of yarn than you might be required to have on hand for a sweater. Yeah, it's like knitting three pairs of socks, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of socks, I'll show you what I'm going to, what I've been working on. This has been my airplane project so I started it when we uh, left Edmonton and I just got past the heel yesterday wow. on a pair of socks for my husband this is a, a matching skein of self-striping yarn by a company called Turtle Pearl from New Brunswick and uh, yeah, I just turned the heel yesterday while I was at the dentist Wow, those are fantastic, Cynthia. And how do you like knitting two at a time? I so yeah. I, I do and I don't. Uh, let's see. The, the advantages of working two at a time is that you don't have to count for your second thing, right? The the downside is that you may end up with your yarns kind of twisting around each other. So it's helpful to have two balls of yarn and turtle pearl always puts her yarn in two skeins so you don't have to split a skein she does it for you so you know you can have two identical socks which is really nice and I think the advantage the super great advantage is that you don't have to count for the second sock because you do everything at the same time but uh you you don't make as much progress you know it's it's nice to see that progress marker working out but because you're working two socks in the round at the same time it goes a little slower. I mean, obviously you're making two socks, so that's the that's the trade-off. Yeah. Um, and you're doing it on one needle, right? Yes, I'm doing magic you, loop. I've become Did you sometimes use two? Uh, I used to. I used to. Uh I've been but now I'm more using magic loop because it's just a little more convenient. I don't have to carry two needles around with me. Um, but certainly, if, if I were going to do anything wider, like let's say, let's say I wanted to do a hat and I didn't have double pointed needles or didn't want to use double pointed needles, I would use two circulars instead of magic loop. Because I find that two circulars doesn't give you the little, I pull a little tight on the edges when I go to you know, finish one needle and work on the other half of the needle. So sometimes in my socks, I'll get a little line running up the side of the sock if I'm doing stockinette stitch. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are places where I prefer to have two needles going around like this, because then where those joins are, I can tighten it up on the needle rather than yeah. on the cord. 
And it's easier to get your cable to come up to the side of your needle in Magic Loop as opposed to double points, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, what? sometimes what people don't like about Magic Loop is that the loop can disappear and then you have to find it again. And so when you're working on two circulars, that never happens. Mm-hmm. You you may. So that's that's interesting. And um, we might have to do a little... We might have to do a little video. We we have a video on our uh, YouTube channel that talks about knitting in the round four different ways, and we talk, we we demonstrate and show, you know, double pointed needles, uh, two circulars, flexi flips, and magic loop. But I think that we should maybe do a longer video where we explain like how you get set up on each of those ones and how. Yeah. A little more time working in the round and explaining the advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, that's a great idea. We'll have to add that to our curriculum. We we taught, well, we'll talk about what we taught a little later on. Uh, when we were in PEI, we taught five classes there. And there was a magic loop one there that we were able to show a few little tips about how to manage that cord. So maybe we'll yeah. chat about that in a little bit. Yeah, and I I think that's you know that's that's a great thing to to talk about because we have this long history of working in a yarn shop, and you know, um, yarn shop owners are not pattern designers. You know, when when you take classes, you can take classes with designers, and that's great because they'll give you a lot of tips from a design perspective, like how to modify things, for example. But yarn shop owners, they're going to give you uh, classes based on all the questions that they've had to answer over the number of years that they've been yarn shop owners. And believe me, there are tons of questions. And most of them revolve around, how did this happen? (laughs) You know, like, how did did I get all my stitches on one needle? That's right. That's right. (laughs) How do I fix this? And yeah, very true. We usually help people when they get into trouble. Yeah, yeah, Little like lawyers. Well, and and again, <laughs> the disclaimer uh, is you know always uh, is always prefaced by the word tink, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Yes, we, we will talk about that some more because we did, when we were teaching in-person classes, we did a bit of tinking as well, which is, you know, knitting, undoing your knitting. And that would be also, I think, a great tutorial to have yeah. in the playlist, right? Sure. <laughs> we're not all about knitting. We are, it's true that most of the classes that we're going to host and that we offer have to do with knitting, but we do have a crochet class coming up. and. Ooh. Yes. When we talk about, the about that, <laughs> when we talk about the classes that we did in PEI, Barb, remind me to talk a little bit about the other crochet class that we have. Yeah, um, but we have a class coming up with Carissa Browning. She is a uh, knit and crochet designer in uh, Austin, Texas. She's, I think she's in Austin. Doesn't matter. She's in Texas. She's a lovely, lovely person, and she's a great crochet instructor. So she's uh, coming to us with a class called Crocheting Mini Yip Yips. And if those, if you, if you're trying to, if you think Yip Yip sounds familiar, but you're not sure what that is, uh, recall Sesame Street. They are the adorable aliens from Sesame Street who discover things about Earth and Earthlings, and they often say things like Yip. Yep, yep, yep. And so uh, Carissa has this pattern to crochet a yip, yip. And so it's, again, that's another class kind of in the uh, realm of toy making because you're going to make something fun and whimsical and it's going to come to life when you put the eyes on it. So this will be a crochet class. You, You don't have to have a huge number of crochet skills. You just need basic stitches and you're going to learn to crochet in the round and to crochet flat, and to crochet firmly to make uh, something that's going to sort of stand up and, and create a container for you afterwards. Yeah, That class is happening on Saturday, October 19th, and uh, it's very, very popular, so sign up yeah. now. That's one not to miss. It, I think in all of the crochet classes, I think this one is probably the most fun, 
and gives you an opportunity to just play with crochet. It's a great one for knitters. It is, absolutely. Uh, we're going to follow that one up with another class that's for beginners in a sense. It's Lace 101 with Kate Atherley. Uh, that's going to be on October 24th. And in this class, Kate's going to teach you how to knit lace. And uh, you're going to take away so many you know, cool techniques from this one. Um, and so you got to take it. It's, it's even if you've knit lace before, uh, when Kate comes to town, uh, it's an opportunity to learn how to do things that you might not have known how to do before. She is so smart. Yeah. And, you know, she's been a technical editor for a long time. So she too, I think, uh, knows some of the mistakes that people make when they uh, try to knit lace. And so I think she'll get into some of that too and talk about yarn overs and slants and directions and all great stuff. Yeah, really great, really great. And then uh, we're going to follow that one up with another Fiberside chat with a guest named Dawn Barker. And she, I don't know her. Do you? She, she's a designer from the U.S. And she definitely was at the Fiberside Summer Call. Mm, yeah. Okay. She's going to come and talk about assigned pooling. Do you know what so that is? So similar to Kate, but probably different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you ever done assigned pooling before, Barb? I have. Yeah, it's fun. It's a nice way of breaking up one of those wild skeins. And I'm sure Kate will probably talk about that a little bit too. But this lady probably has some really cool, maybe stitch techniques that you could use. Yeah, I think she's going to um, kind of inspire and motivate us to consider taking one of those variegated yarns that have, a, you know, that, that dash of color that drew your eye in the first place and uh, assign a particular stitch or stitch pattern to that. And mm -hmm. that's what this whole idea of assigned pooling is about. It's a way of, you know, taking that yarn that pools on you and doing something creative and innovative with it. So uh, that's a, that's a fiber side chat on Sunday, October 27th. Maybe she'll give a coupon code too for her patterns. Maybe, maybe. I, they often do. And that's a really nice way of getting kind of like one of their designs yeah. on sale. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The um, Then, then we're doing uh, a brand new class with Holly Yo. And this is a class that I'm very excited about. It's a knit flat sock. Yeah, uh, this this is Me so cool. This is like knitting them on my machine only by hand. Yeah. Can't yeah. help but think that, you know, Holly's taking machine knitting concepts and translating them into hand knit patterns, which is what machine knitters do all the time. We take hand knit patterns and convert them into the machine. So this is the other way around. And she's got a really interesting heel called the bifurcated heel yeah, bifurcated so, yeah <laughs> really close uh, but yeah. it's a heel that she found from sports socks mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll hold up my this is a, a sock that I've done from her she's published a pattern called the over easy socks and you begin at the top here and you work uh, down the instep uh, creating a, a really great place to join your sock later. You do a uh, rounded toe with um, a special uh, short row technique called shadow wraps. And then you work down the bottom of the sock, joining as you go. And then you get this really cool heel. And I think if I hold it up close to the camera, you can see it's almost got like, like a V in it. And so you're going to create some wedges in your heel, which makes the this this heel give you lots of room across the instep and then back up to the top so in class we're going to work on a small sock with a worsted weight yarn so that you have an opportunity to knit all the stitches and do all the things on a on a like a toddler or child size sock and then at the same time after you've done that you can cast on and work on her over easy sock because we're going to gift 
the pattern to all the recipients who are in the class. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, sign up for that one. That's going to be great. And two two sessions, Cynthia? That's right. Yeah. We you know with sock classes, you don't want to rush, right? You want to you want to be able to uh practice in real time with Holly or later on with the recording when you hit pause. But we don't want to rush through any of these things. There's a lot of brand new techniques. It brand new to me and I've been knitting for a long time. Technique. And yet, and yet, easy because you're doing them flat, back and forth, knitting and purling. So, not there's nothing about you know really having to manage your needles. It's Correct. more connecting as you go, and yeah, yeah. So this is a great class for 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 folks who have never knit socks before, uh, or for folks who have knit socks before, but you want to explore a different way of doing it. Yeah, and I think. For sock knitters, that's sort of like the attractive proposition there is this new way of doing it. We knit so many socks that uh, you know it's kind of nice to have uh, another method in your in your toolkit, right? Yeah. Uh, so that is coming up on the two Wednesdays, October 30th and November 6th. And we just posted that workshop up recently. So it's there on our website for you to uh, sign up for. And I'll put a link into the description on this podcast as well. And then right after Holly gets started, the first weekend in November is the Rowan Connect event. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity to spend some quality time with um, makers from around the world. Uh, Rowan does such a great job of pulling fabulous instructors, designers, um, yarn shop owners, movers and shakers all together into one room, one platform on one weekend. And, uh, you know, you can come and take classes with us, but there are classes with Zandy Peters and Patty Lyons and Fiona Ellis and Kate Atherley and Lisa Richardson and um, Chloe. Hmm. Hero. Yeah. And Samira Hill. She does these great crochet classes. Oh, and there's a woman named Alexandra Davidoff who's going to do dragon scale knitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, for makers, uh, let's not forget our makers, because those those are the ones that this is really targeted to. And, you know, all using Rowan yarns. So you're going to get lots of previews about yarn and things like that, too. And then we're going to be teaching there as well. Yeah, yeah. We're teaching some, uh, we're teaching two fun classes. <laughs> yeah. One of them really close to my heart, one that I love, the the lace beaded wristlets, I think is one of my favorites. Did I bring some with me? Oh, I did. Yeah, you were, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I uh, haven't cast on yet. We, we wanted to do up some samples in some rowing yarns, some additional rowing yarns. And uh, I have... I have my Rowan yarn sitting here, but I haven't cast on yet. So that's my plan for today is yeah. to turn this uh, this ball of Rowan sock yarn into a beautiful wristlet. Oh, super sweet, Barb. I'm gonna it, give this Yeah, back. here's a pair here. These are kind of like minis. Uh, but what we're doing is we're teaching how to do this lace pattern. It's a small project. It too is knit flat. And it's got a little a hole in the side seam that you can put your thumb into. And then just for fun, we're teaching you how to knit beads on it. So you can do the beads if you like, or you don't have to do the beads. Here's another pair that I just finished, Cynthia. And these are out of uh, oh. Rome Patina. That's really nice. That, that, that looks like it's got a bit of a halo to it. Yeah, it's a beautiful yarn. Um, it's a little thicker than the pattern suggests. It's called patina, but it's about 46% mohair, 20% wool, 
24% nylon, and 10% polyester. Mm. It comes, it's one of those select yarns, so it's not um, always in their lineup, but they do have it on their website right now, and you can order it. I used a ball of a pretty sort of oyster color. Yeah. It's very creamy with sort of a pinky taupe undertone, mm -hmm. and it has a little bit of gold sparkle in it. Wow. So, and then those beads. Yeah, I picked these sort of copper color beads for it. And uh, it has 273 yards on every 50 gram ball. Wow. 150 meters. So I, I think I'm getting, uh, here's an, got another pair on the go. Mm -hmm. And so I'm pretty sure you can get four um, hand warmers or two pairs out of one ball. Wow. That's great. Your second pair may not may, may be shorter, perhaps. Uh, I, I my second pair. Um, this one, I think I did six rows instead of seven. Okay, this one's full sized. Six repeats. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the, this pattern also has a pico edge, which I left off in this okay. one. I just wanted these ones plain, but you can also learn this really cool little pico bind off in the class that we're teaching on this one. Here's a pair in purple that are sort of in progress. Yeah. I'm going to show you how to make these. That's so pretty, Barb. Yeah. And the other thing you can do is make cuffs. This is what we'll suggest to people in class is that they make a cuff first, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just imagine you could make a pair of these and then you could pick up stitches along here and knit a mitten out. Sure. Sure. Or maybe pick up stitches along the other edge and, you know, attach it to a sleeve. Yes. I mean, there's so many options. Yeah. You could do all kinds of things with it. It could be the bottom of a sweater, too. Yeah. You know, the cuff. Very yeah. nice. And then what else are we teaching? Uh, so the your other, favorites. <laughs> the other class that we're doing is on sock repair. And I love, uh, I love this class because I knit a lot of socks. Uh, well, as you can see, right? I've got a pair on the go for my husband. Uh, and I'm, I've got another pair of knit flat socks going from... Uh, from Holly's pattern. So I always have a pair of socks on the go and it always, they take a lot of time. They really take a lot of time. And so when you get a hole in the bottom or a, you know, a thin spot in the bottom, it's a little bit distressing. Yes. <laughs> but All that work, you know, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to be able to mend your socks too and give them another life, I feel. Yeah. You know, and to be able to you know how to do that, um, a lot of people I don't think even have any idea at all how to how to repair them. So they just end up, you know, not being worn or being thrown out. And what a waste that is. Yeah, there's there's um, there's there's a lot of um, care that goes into repairing your socks, and you know, in the past you might have darned them and it may have ended up kind of lumpy and maybe it wore through. Have you been darned. looking in my sock drawer? <laughs> so in our class, we're going to teach you some clever ways to repair your socks. And uh, we're also going to talk about prevention of holes. So we'll talk a little bit about reinforcement, but we'll also talk about duplicate stitch when they start to wear thin. And then we'll go into a knitted patch. We'll go into a woven patch. And you'll have an opportunity to practice these things as well. And um, we might even, if time permits, talk a little bit about sock surgery and this is what I do when that sock has been repaired. It's well loved and it's been repaired and repaired. And now it's time to just like knit a new toe uh, or knit a new foot. 
uh, because it's going to save you many hours of not having to knit up to the foot. Um, so there's there's some opportunities there to do a little bit of surgery if time permits. So I'm excited about that. that. That's true. Now, I know you have two more classes you want to talk about, Cynthia. And we've got, like, it's a lot of talk about classes right now. But that's because this is fall. This is our prime season. You know, come the new year, I think Cynthia and I are going to put our feet up for a little bit and take a little break from a lot of the classes. So if there's any of these that you want to take, now's the time to sign up for them. Cynthia, tell us about the last two, because these ones are so cool and they're new. Yeah, yeah. We've got Kate Atherley coming uh, in the early November to do a class for us on the Baby Surprise Jacket Boot Camp. And I okay, now that's a blast from the past. Really, Elizabeth Zimmerman? Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth Zimmerman's Baby Surprise Jacket. And remember how people used to bring those jackets into the shop and they were lost and they couldn't find their way and they didn't know how to fold them. And, you know, it's... So Kate's going to do... Back a in... 2002 I just want to add in there that's when that was yes yeah that was the trend everybody was making those and that's over like 20 years ago and wow. isn't it amazing how things come back around now yeah so what I love about this project is the fact that it's done in garter stitch it's done flat and it's done in one piece so when you are done with this you know, project, you have a couple of seams to sew up and you're done. It's, it's great. But what's really cool to me about it is that because it's done in garter stitch, it lays flat. Uh, so it, it, you know, it makes seaming so much easier. And if you stripe it, the stripes go all the way around the sweater and they bend with the sweater as well. It's such a clever concept. Elizabeth Zimmerman originally published this pattern in a newsletter. So it's very pithy, <laughs> as she likes to say. Then she added it to a book. And now um, Schoolhouse Press, which is the company that she and her daughter, Meg Swanson, started, published the pattern as a booklet. So you can get it in, um, it, the booklet contains a child, a baby size, a child size, and adult sizes, as well as adapt adaptations for it. So the booklet is quite big. Um, but Kate Atherley will take you through a mini version of the sweater, like a toy-sized version of the sweater. So you can practice with different yarns. You can throw different yarns together because the striping is so cool in this one. And um, you can do a little swatch with Kate. And then you can go to your stash and you can pull out all the yarns that have been languishing there because you didn't know what to do with them. And you can put them into a baby or a child size sweater to begin with. And then who knows, maybe you might even go into an adult sweater. I think it's really a really cool class because you know granny squares are coming back. And I think this whole idea of the garter stitch sweater with lots of colorful stripes is also going to be super popular. And we're going to follow that up with another class from Carissa Browning. This one's called Breaking Plaid, and she'll be doing that on Saturday, November the 9th. Carissa has this great way of combining double knitting and marling to create plaid that is so eye-catching. Like, you're going to love it. And so we're going to do a little coaster size sampler in class and then uh, if you want to experiment with more of this style of plaid uh, she's got a great kerchief pattern called breaking plaid and uh, you can you can go on and, and do that project next so that's going to be super fun Krissa is an amazing teacher she's really friendly and has a great way of demonstrating the techniques in this one so you're going to learn a little bit of double knitting a little bit of marling in this class. Is there any prerequisite or homework? No, not for either of them. So not for the baby oh. surprise jacket boot camp and not for breaking plaid either. Mm -hmm. That's great. So even beginners could could jump in on this one. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you need to know how to knit uh, and, and, and you need to know how to, we think now, in Carissa's, 
I'm not sure if you even know, need to know how to purl, but definitely for the baby surprise jacket, you don't have to know how to purl. It's all done in knit stitches. <laughs> so both classes, it'll kind of open up your perspective and blow your mind because they're so uh, they're so interesting. Yeah. So people can just go to our website and sign up there, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yarniversity.ca. Just go to uh, upcoming classes. And uh, you can sign up by the month. You can look at classes by the month, or you can look at them by the instructor that's teaching them. It's our favorite. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's chat oh. now a little bit about PEI and yeah. share of our our classes and some of the fun that we had too. It wasn't all work. There was a little bit of play. That's right. Yeah. And made some great meals. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we arrived in Charlottetown and we uh we arrived early in the morning <laughs> yeah when we got to the hotel the doors were locked do you remember that mm -hmm. yeah one of the employees was, had to let us in it was about uh what like 1 30 maybe in the morning something uh, like that yeah Atlantic time yeah and then we didn't have to teach until later that day <laughs> Mm -hmm. So we went immediately to bed, but then we got up and had a walk around. And so we saw, um, so the, the hotel that we were staying at was right near the water's edge. In fact, it was so um, deep there, the water, that cruise ships would come in and dock uh, like just a stone's throw away from the hotel. That's right. And the classroom that we were in had a beautiful window that looked out onto the ocean. And for one of our days, there was a cruise ship that was parked there for the whole day. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the cruise ships, this was sort of like their last cruise. They were uh, coming through Charlottetown to stop for the day. And then they were heading off to probably like Miami or the Bahamas or something to spend the winter. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun. It was, it was. And we had great weather. Uh, I know in some of the photos that we're looking at, the sky is overcast, but the, the, you know, the clouds kind of blew over and the sun came out and it was, it was beautiful uh, in downtown Charlottetown. We could, we could walk and have an excellent meal and there was always lots of seafood uh, on order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I I did I have to say I indulged in a few lobster rolls while we were there. <laughs> Who didn't? <laughs> you can't go to Charlottetown or to the Atlantic Canada without trying lobster, right? Right. Right. What did you think of the downtown? It's so it was nice and clean. Uh, you know, people where there's lots of you know pedestrian crosswalks and the drivers were I thought very respectful allowing you know all these people who are walking around to cross without no no the, there's no lights right there's no stop lights it's just four-way stops through the downtown so it has a real kind of um small town kind of feeling even though it's the capital city of prince edward island yeah mm -hmm. yeah I thought it was great. I was lucky enough too when you were in Moncton to be able to go to their farm day in the city mm -hmm. where they closed off some of the streets and vendors came out and sold all their farm vegetables. Um, I had a PEI, I shared a PEI potato with my friend Vivian. <laughs> we got to see all sorts of wonderful displays and uh things that people had made and were selling in the street. I think everybody who lives in Charlottetown came out that day because the streets were just packed. Yeah, it's it's nice. They, so they set up tents and awnings right on the street, kind of like a like a great farmers market. Hey, yes, that's right. Yeah, and we went walking into some of the other parts of downtown as well, and it was surprising to me that 
there were so many churches, old, old churches built in, you know, like the 1800s. And um, all within, you know, like two or three blocks of each other. Beautiful yeah. old buildings made of, you know, that, um, forget what that is called. I think it's like soft stone or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those big it's stones, a, right? They've been sort of cut out of rock. Yeah, there's a name for it. And the architecture was just incredible. So beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an amazing, it's kind of amazing in those spires, those church spires, you can see them from almost any uh, high point in Charlottetown. Yes. Certainly from our hotel room. Yeah, that's right. Lots of great little shops too. We walked into that one that was selling wool sweaters and it had, there was a little production team in the back of the shop who were making mittens and hats and sweaters out yeah. of local wool. I found some of my favorite wooden needles, birch needles from mm -hmm. um, River John needles were sold in a little shop there. And then there was the Art Craft Council. What a beautiful place that was. Right? Yeah. Yeah, we ended up we ended up buying a few things there. Uh, and I've got some video that I'll insert here uh, that to show to show uh, a lot of the products. Mm -hmm. I think you you paused and had a quite a nice look at these journals. Yes. Well, I remember one of our first learning trips that we went on was to Vancouver, where we took book binding. You and I, I think, spent a week at Mawa doing yeah. a book binding course. So this kind of came back to me because we made uh, paper books and bound them together in a class. It was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. This lady makes them here, makes them in uh, Charlottetown. Yes. There was a lot of rug hooking on display. And, Beautiful rugs and yeah. art pieces, you know, that you would never put on your floor, but you'd hang on your walls. Just gorgeous uh, pieces of art. Yeah. They, they were, I, and we'll, I'll show you a couple of the things that I bought while I was there. And I mean, you'll do the same. We'll do the same. But so that was, you know, Charlottetown. And then we also went to the PEI Fiber Festival and there were some uh, vendors there as well. Mm -hmm. Lots of them, not just selling yarn, but um, vending and displaying a lot of rug hooking supplies. Mm -hmm. We Shirley met up. Scott was there. <laughs> we met up with our friend Shirley Scott or Cheryl the Pearl. <laughs> she has a new book coming out. Yes, it wasn't at the show. It was a little bit delayed, and so she didn't have it there. But she was in the Briggs and Little booth, yeah. and Briggs and Little sell all the wool yes. in, in that area. And they had a book that she had contributed to and, and written stories for uh, called Knit in Canada. That's right. I have a copy of that book on my shelf. Me too. Yes. It's it's got to be one of the earliest books that I've ever had. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was written in the 70s or 80s. Yes. And you bought some yarn while you were <laughs> at the Fiber Festival. I did. You know, um, I stopped in at Shell Ridge Yarns, which was a yarn that we used to carry in our shop because uh, Deb and Lynn created a special colorway for the PEI Fiber Festival that was inspired by those beautiful red rocks and that red sort of dirt soil that PEI is so known for. And then uh, I got two skeins of that and I wanted to make a color work cowl. Wow. You um, uh, created the, a pretty cowl pattern and hat pattern using a special pattern that we teach in a class. And I wanted to do one of those cows and maybe a pair of mittens or a hat with this color combo. 
Wow. So this is a DK, and I picked up another skein of DK and a beautiful teal from Marion at One Stitch More. She was just a, a fun girl that we met on the elevator. She was wearing these devilish horns, and there's a great little story about uh, how she uh, tempts people with her beautiful yarns, and it certainly <laughs> was tempting for me. I bought uh, a sweater quantity of her, what I would call a very heavy lace yarn. It's almost fingering weight. This yarn was so beautiful. I loved the twist and the softness to it, as well as the colorway. So I'm going to do a bit of a lace yoke sweater in this. Oh, that's so nice, Barb. I also bought a few things. Uh, I got two skeins of yarn from Police and Harmony. And again, like you, I wanted to get something that was, I really love this kind of corally red color. And then I got a black because it's super hard to find a hand dyed black. It very difficult. And those colors that you got are, would be beautiful for color work. Is that what you're thinking about doing? Yeah, I, like you, I was thinking that I would do a color work cowl. And so I thought I would get two highly contrasting colors. But uh, we'll see. We'll see what I end up doing. And then we came across our friend Jennifer from the Yarn Therapist. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't help myself. I had to buy some more self-striping sock yarn. Yes. This one is um, a Blue Face Lester, a BFL with a bit of nylon in it. Ooh. So she told me it doesn't take the dye quite as deeply as her uh, merino yarns do. But this should be more durable than the merino yarns for sock. So wow, I'll get a pair of socks so cool. last time. Yeah, you have to check out her website if you haven't had a chance to go there. She is brilliant with making yeah. self-striping yarns. Yeah. And then we picked up a couple of Rowan crochet hooks from Fleece and Harmony. They have these rosewood crochet hooks. And I, I haven't used it much yet. I did use it when we were teaching a class in PEI. But I have to say, Barbara, what I really like about this is the metal tip on it. So I'm quite pleased with this Rowan crochet hook. I'm so pleased I'm keeping it in its container. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is really cool as well. This is a, um, it's called Stitch a Memory Lavender Sachet, and it's in the shape of a fox. And so in this kit, you get a uh, wool felt um, and you get lavender blossoms. I'll take this out of the package uh, and replace it. Um, but to make a little sachet with lavender in it. And the lavender that's in this kit is so fragrant that I had it in my backpack and it made all the things in my backpack smell like lavender. So I was very yes. pleased. Yes, I was just going to say, um, isn't it nice when you find something natural like that that's yes. highly scented and reminds you of like, you know, being in a lavender field or something? Yeah, yeah. it's a very generous package of lavender and then there's embroidery floss and um everything that you need to create this lovely sachet and i think you got a kit too barb i did yes mine's um a little more summery colors and you make a a coaster uh a, sort of like a a placemat and four coasters so nice huh. yeah very very nice yeah uh, Cynthia, okay. I wanted to mention that in when we were talking about the marketplace, there's a video in there that I took of uh, the ladies from Botanical Fibers. Oh, and this this was the uh, mum that we met in the uh, when we were having lunch in the teachers' hospitality room, and she was there with her daughter and uh, son and they their new little baby, and. Um, this Emma Doucette dyes yarns with natural products from Nova Scotia. One of the dyes she uses is logwood, and it made the most beautiful purple colorway. Yeah. So, yeah, take a look at bo botanical fibers because, you know, a lot of dyers, you know, dye a lot of yarn, but not too many of them 
use natural dyes. And she had just the most beautiful booth and yarns, samples, and patterns as well. Lovely. And then we had the opportunity to meet up with some of uh, the makers from our makers meetup. Uh, and this is this is us sitting at a table. Um, and I'm going to show you another group shot that we took in, in a little bit. But wasn't that fun? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, to meet up with people. Kathy was from Philadelphia. And Cheryl was from Nova Scotia. And we had friends from Edmonton and Sherwood Park come. Yeah, Belinda from Calgary. It was yeah. great meeting <laughs> with PEI. I hope we get invited back again. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say too that while we were in Charlottetown, the day that you went to the farmers or farm day in the city, I went to New Brunswick uh, to visit with my mother-in-law, and um, I, I rented a car and I drove across the Confederation Bridge. Yeah, wow. I got a chance to kind of see a little bit of the. I always forget how wooded uh, New Brunswick is. How yes, what it is. So I've got a little bit of a video here, driving along the highway, and you can see how some of the trees are turning um, the beautiful reds and uh, golds that uh, that just make you know that make the fall such a beautiful time in the Maritimes. Um, so it was a lovely drive, and I had a lovely visit, and uh, it was really it was really nice to be able to see her while we were there, so close, just one province away. I think it's fair to say that we highly recommend the PEI Fiber Festival if you get a chance to go. It's yeah. kind of like a once in a lifetime experience. It is. And and I don't know if this was just for Halloween or not, but in Charlottetown, they had scarecrows all over the place. That's right. That was the first day that we got there, and they had decorated the town up so nice. It was a little chilly that day, too, wasn't it? <laughs> But we, uh, but we had a great time, and we met up with some friends as well, uh, who came up and said hello to us, and so that was that was so nice. That was fun. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is my Halloween outfit. <laughs> I think you look so adorable with those with those Anne of Green Gable braids, Barb. These aren't our pictures. These were taken by our friend Kathy. Uh, she went out to uh, the Island Hills Farm or Island Hill Farm. Wow. She had a day there. And so we'll, we'll share these photos with you as well because Kathy uh, told us we could. But she had a great day at the farm. This was, I think, before the day before the workshops started. And uh, she got a tour of this lovely farm. Look at that goat. <laughs> This looks like a fun day. Yeah. We'll have to check that out next time we go back. Mm -hmm. Hashtag I'm... cutest place on earth. Wow. There we go. <laughs> the, the gentleman gentleman's club. <laughs> so as you can see, a fun day was had by all. And it uh, looks like she topped it off with some uh, red island cider. Oh, oh, and some oysters on the sh on the half shell. Well, Barb, this was a lovely kind of recollection of our trip to PEI. Again, you know, like you said, we want to encourage everyone to take a trip to Prince Edward Island on mm -hmm. Canada's Atlantic, one of Canada's Atlantic provinces. And uh, whether you go there by cruise ship or airplane or you drive, you're guaranteed to have a wonderful time. Very, very friendly and welcoming place mm -hmm. uh, so yeah let's let's cross our fingers and hope to get back there yes well we will we'll just say that we'll go back see you next year yeah yeah okay so while we were in prince edward island just very quickly we taught five classes uh they were magic loop mittens um belted slippers uh learn a little lace with queen vicky's wristlets um Crochet for knitters. Crochet for knitters, which is super popular. And, and strand 
color work. Stranded color work, where we taught you how to work with two colors at the same time on each mm -hmm. row. Uh, so these were those were the five classes that we did, and we uh, also offer these classes online. Um, so if you would like to see any of them, uh, let us know. Put, uh, put something in the comments down below about a class that you'd like to view from us. And also get in touch with your local yarn shop. We're more than happy to share our classes with your LYS and we can offer those classes via Zoom. Um, and so your, your local yarn shop can offer an online class uh, with Barb and Cynthia. We'd be happy to do that. Uh, wherever wherever you may be a class that you might want to do yeah yeah so whether it's you know making those beautiful cushy felted slippers or maybe learning a little lace or learning how to strand color work or it, anything you know ask us i bet you we have a class for it <laughs> that's right and i'm gonna teach for you so we're going to queue up the outro for our podcast and then, but stay on as soon as the outro is over, there'll be a tutorial video that's going to show you how to cast on two at a time for Magic Loop. We talk about this in a two at a time sock class that we do. So we're going to say, you know, for the cuff of your sock, you can cast on this way. Just remember that it would be the same thing if you were casting on for the cuff of two mittens or the cuff yeah. of two sleeves. It all works exactly the same way. So stay tuned for that tutorial video. It will show up after our outro, but also I'll put a link to the video down in the description below. It's such a handy skill to know and to, to use. So enjoy our little gift to you today. And thank you for being with us here today. If you can, we'd always love it if you would like the video. And uh, if you haven't already subscribed to our podcast, we'll always put in a plug for that too. We love to reach 10,000 subscribers. So uh, thanks for being with us, friends. We really, we really love having uh, some time with you today. And we hope you enjoyed all the things that we're showing you. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you next month. This is the cast on for simultaneous socks on Magic Loop. I'm using two colors of yarn to help differentiate between the two socks. So my gray yarn is going to be sock number one and this uh, burgundy or purple yarn over here, that's gonna be sock number two. In order to cast on Magic Loop style and have the socks be mounted uh, symmetrically. We're going to begin uh, by casting on half the number of stitches for the sock. So in this sample I'm going to cast on, I'm going to have 24 stitches for each sock and so the first cast on I'm going to do will be 12 stitches, half the number of stitches that I want in total for my sock. You need to use a long tail cast on for this um, for setting up your socks this way. So that's why I'm choosing the long tail cast on to cast on my first 12 stitches. Again, the first sock that you cast on, you'll cast on half of the total number of stitches that you need for your sock in total. So I've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, and 12. Now I'm going to cast on for my second sock and for this one, I will cast on all 24 stitches. Okay, so I have 12 stitches cast on for my first sock. That's half of the total number of stitches that I want. And I have 24 stitches cast on for the second sock. Now what I'm going to do is slide all of my stitches 
the 12 and the 24 down onto the cable part of my needle and I'm going to count off 12 stitches or the midpoint of the second sock. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And so I'm going to pull the cord out in my second sock so that I have 12 stitches on either side of the loop on the cable. Now what I'm going to do is cast on the other half of the first sock stitches. So I find it easiest to figure this out if I mount all my stitches up onto the hard part of the needle. This just keeps the stitches from sliding around so much and makes them a little bit easier to deal with. So I've got all my stitches mounted up on the hard part of the needle and uh, what I would like to have is this um, this set of stitches on the back side. Um, what I mean is I want that needle to be further away from me. So while it's sitting like this, I'm just going to kind of rotate it. Let me do that again. I'm taking my needle and I'm kind of rotating it around so that um, this needle with just the 12 stitches on it is in front of me and the stitches with the 12 and 12 on it is to the back of me. Now that I've got my needle set up with this one with the 12 and 12 stitches on the back and the one with just the 12 stitches on the front, I can move that second sock out of the way. I'm kind of done with it for now. And I want to cast on the other 12 stitches that go with this first sock. So holding these stitches in the back and the empty needle in the front, I now use my fingers to separate the two yarns and I'm going to do a long tail cast on onto the second needle. Snugging it up a little bit here, I don't want to leave a long gap between the edge of this these 12 stitches and the beginning of this one. So I'm just snugging it up a little bit and now I'm going to make another one. And this second needle it kind of gets in the way a little bit, but uh, if you can just kind of bear with it for a few minutes, it gets easier to cast on as you go. You see how now I can just kind of focus on that second knitting needle and I'm casting on the second set of 12 stitches. Two, four, six, eight, nine, oops, 10. I made the tail really long on one and really short on the other. 11, 12. So now I have, let me push these back up again, I have my stitches cast on for both of my socks. This is the, the first sock, this is the second sock, and my tails are, are hanging in exactly the same place. That's what I need to begin with for Magic Loop. 